Hello, this is Henry Schaefer and welcome to Old and New Testament Survey. It is a summary of the books of the Old and the New Testament. Now what you're going to get here, you're going to get some unique insight concerning each book of the Bible. Key verses that will just jump out at you and bring new revelation to you. Relevant truth for today. Some special notes that I have dictated and put in my Bible over the years that I have studied. Also, there's going to be a, it will be a brief but comprehensive summary of each book. Now, you can also look for some wow moments uh, of revelation of truth that we're going to give you. Now, if you're ready to start out on Old and New Testament survey, come on and join us. Man, we're going to have a great time studying the Bible together. Confident faith. Look at this one here. Daniel, the apocalypse of the Old Testament, presents a surprisingly comprehensive sweep of a prophetic history. Now, this is something I want you to know. You need to know this just as a student of the Bible, this, what I'm getting ready to tell you. You need to, you, if, uh, if I'm telling you, you need to know this, you need to grab a pencil out and you need to start saying, I'm going to write this down. I've got to put this somewhere. Watch this here. Um, and this could be even on, if you're trying to do things licensing or if you're, if someone asks you this question, you need to know the answer. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell it to you. After the introductory chapters in, um, of Daniel, they're written in Hebrew. Daniel all of a sudden switches to Aramaic, a language in chapters that starts off in chapters 2, goes all the way to chapter 7, to describe the future course of Gentile world powers. Then in chapters 8 and 12, Daniel reverts to Hebrew to survey the future of the Jewish nation under Gentile domination. So what he does, <clears throat> he starts out in Hebrew language, he shifts to Aramaic, written in Aramaic, and that was a common language of common people then. It wasn't Hebrew, it wasn't a Hebrew tongue, but it was a language they knew. So it was a common so he's he at that time he's he's speaking to Gentile people. Now he's still speaking to everybody. But the language changes. It's like if I'm here talking, but I'm talking to everybody, and then just say there's some Spanish people in here, and all of a sudden I start speaking in Spanish. Well, I'm all talking to all of y'all, but I'm really speaking to the people who, who understand Spanish. You know what I mean? They say, hey, he's talking my language. He's talking about me. That's what he's doing here. When he's writing, he's shifting languages like that. So the Bible is written in three languages. What are the three languages? You go to Hebrews, one of them. Aramaic's the other one. What's the other one? Greek. So a lot of people say it's, it's Hebrew and it's Greek. Only a small portion, it's only in the book of Daniel, is written in what? Aramaic. Now, so there have been. <clears throat> so let's talk about the language. You know, we talk, you know, it's a different language, right? So um, I was preaching here one day, and I, and I don't know what I was preaching about. Most people don't know what I was preaching about anyway, so it didn't really don't matter, does it? <laughs> but I started speaking in tongues. Uh, and you know, whatever was happening, I was speaking in tongues. And I don't know how long I spoke in tongues, and I was preaching, and I was speaking in tongues. Well, when it went to YouTube, okay, it's on YouTube, right? So it's, here's what happens. As I, am, as I am speaking in English, it's interpreting on YouTube in English. You know what I mean? It's, my words are popping up. When it got to that part where I was speaking in tongues, you know what popped up? Speaking in an Aramaic language. That's what popped up. He's speaking some type of an Aramaic language. And then when I stopped, it went back to English. Into that. I went, isn't that crazy, everybody? Isn't that crazy? So my language is some kind of what? Aramaic language. And, and, and you two translated it and say. I don't know what he's saying, but it's in Aramaic. That's what he's what he's speaking in. All right, that's crazy, isn't it? I don't know. So y'all y'all think about that. All those people, they say, yeah, right. <coughs> anyway, I saw that. And I thought it was pretty pretty amazing. Okay, so um, the theme of God's sovereign control in the affairs of world history clearly emerges and provides comfort for the future church. So we're in a time frame that we know that hey, this, this, this thing's going to turn out all right. Everybody, mm -hmm. the Bible tells the Bible tells us so. It's going to be all right. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. Now, one of the things when we ever get ready to study this here, 
You're going to look at Babylon um, and, and it was gold. Persians was silver. Greeks was bronze. And then, then, uh, um, then Rome was more like steel, you know, iron, iron steel. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? But when you start looking at their, when you start looking at their country and their cultures, you go find that Babylon did a lot of things with gold. Persia was silver. They had, they minted silver coins, so a lot of their stuff was done in silver. The Greeks was done in bronze. They had bronze swords, bronze shields. You know, you got to realize the metals are getting better, stronger. Then after they pass off the scene, who comes on the scene? The Romans do, but they come in with their iron swords and different things that one was able to overturn the other but when you start looking at all of these when you study them in depth that the even the the, the metal the the uh, animals that are used to um, depict them like um, um, Greece had the leopard with, was it four wings right For leopard had four wings and why was it when you look at is that on there the leopard with four wings <clears throat> it's used. Y'all, do y'all see it on there? Yeah. Somebody. So the leopard with four wings represents who? Greece. And that was uh, who was the who was the, um, the 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 one who overthrew the known world? Alexander the Great. He 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 um, he overthrew the known world at that time. I think he was thirty something years old when he died. Um, there were no more worlds to conquer. He and the reason why his is, is uh, used as a leper is because he conquered the world so fast. I mean, that's why it was used. He was faster than any of the rest. He did it quickly. He got over over the, and then the four wings represents the four generals that were under him. That after he died, the it, it, his his kingdom was dis, was divided up into four different places that his that his generals did. So every one of these things are so symbolic. If you don't have time just to sit here and tell them all and what all does it mean and everything, that's why it's almost like you have to do an individual study. But I thought the band did such a great job as an overview mm-hmm. of world history and everything, putting, putting, it, putting it all together. And even when you look at the feet of the last kingdom, is that on there? Yeah, look at the feet of the last kingdom. What does it say there, the last days? Mm-hmm. What does it say, iron and clay? will not mix. Well, if that's the old Roman Empire that would be in, over in the Rome, Rome area in Europe, okay, so we look over there that they're all not Europeans, and especially now that you have what coming into the country? Being flooded with Muslims. So now when it talks about that iron and clay will not mix, it's not so much necessarily even talking about that the people won't mix, you know, that won't come together. But it's almost like religiously they won't mix. Is that you have one religion that is Christianity and you have another religion that's Muslim and they won't mix. See what I'm talking about? So there's a lot there's a lot that you can say about all of these and that's where the detailed study comes in at. That makes sense? So it's crazy stuff, isn't it? But uh, that's what I like and I, and I started thinking, man, this is so good and you got so much in it. It's, it's rich. Daniel is rich from, uh, from where a lot of people have put their ideas out. And everything, and then another thing is from the date when Jesus was um, crucified is is um, the years are exactly uh, mapped out <clears throat> in here, where it shows that time frame at that they know from this time frame to when Messiah would come until he was, was would be killed and crucified is in the book of Daniel. Those those years are there. You can see them, and then of course. We're in the seventieth year, the seventieth week of Daniel. We're getting close to it anyway. You know, being the seven years of tribulation, that three and a half years. So there's a lot going on there. You need to be, you, need, you know, you need to be able to, you need to be able to talk, to, you need to be able to talk about it in a rational way so that people can. I'm not saying you have to be a Bible scholar, but you need to know certain bullet points. Uh, this past, this this past, or I think it was yesterday, we were at work and uh, somebody on the news said, well. I ran, uh, we're sending a warship over to uh, uh, Iraq and Iran. And I had someone says, Henry, what's going on? 
when all that's going, I said, well, let me tell you what's happening. You got, you got Ezekiel 38, 39. You got all of this here going. They said, what? I said, yeah, that's what the Bible's talking about in the last days. So they, they use you as a, okay, he is the walking Bible. So when we have a question, we're going to go ask him. You know what I mean? That's it. So you got to have some answers to them. And, and, and again, they caught me off guard. They, says, they say, is May, is, is May significant in the Bible? And I'm going, no, he ain't got nothing. No, he ain't nothing mad about it. So does it have anything to do with Israel? I said, oh yeah, it's got a lot to do with it. Then I was able to tell him about May 14, 1948. I said, oh yeah, man, that's a lot going on. So, look at this one here. <coughs> Pardon me. The uh, another theme in this book is the emphasis on separation to God with Daniel as the ultimate example from his decision not to eat the king's food to his refusal to pray to the king. Daniel displayed such uncompromising spirit that spectacular opportunities were open to God's to display the power on Daniel's behalf. Now, look at this here. You know, you got to think about this here. Well, why did Daniel get thrown in the lion's den? So let's do this here. So let's think about it, put it together in our mind. So now we got one king that's setting him up over the kingdom. You heard he was set up over all the kingdom, then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm-hmm. Now all of a sudden, they're going to throw him in the dying lines then. Right. What's, what happened? Right. What happened? Something happened big time for him to go from that to they're going to throw him in the lines then. So when you look at, look at this one here. You see what happens up here. You see that this Babylonian empire goes off the scene under Daniel's life. Remember, he's the one that's saying that, uh, who, hey, can, can somebody interpret this handwriting on the wall? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So they call him in because none of them could do it. So he, right. they call him in. Right. And while he is uh, telling them that you've been weighed in the balance and found and wanting, mm-hmm. that at that very moment in time, that the Persians are on the outside of the city of Babylon and they had diverted the river. So he was surrounded with a moat river around it, the Persians had diverted the water into a marsh and lowered the water around the city and the gates and everything. When the water got so low, it was like walking across the Savannah River when they took the dike down. So the whole army was able to walk under the gates and go right on in at that very time. See what I mean? Well, when they took over, that means Nebuchadnezzar, that means uh, Belshazzar and all them are killed and are all they've done all done away with, but they don't get rid of Daniel. Daniel, you don't get rid. I mean, how are you gonna operate this place? You, you don't get rid of Daniel, but all of a sudden, what happens here in this book right here? Daniel is now thrown in the lion's den. See right there? You have another king coming on that don't like him. Doesn't like what he's doing because the other king is dead now. So now he's got to prove himself. God's got to prove himself to that one. So when you start looking at the book, and if you don't see the timeline, say, why is he thrown in the lines then? What did he do? Well, another king came on the scene. So God's got to prove to him. Is this all right, everybody? Yeah. It, makes, it makes puts it together for you so you understand. Yeah. Yeah. God's got to prove it to that king yeah. as well through, through the lines then. And uh, th- things like that. So, So you can see that there are four elements in the message of Daniel. First of all, God is what? He's all-knowing. Say, so He's all-knowing. All-knowing. He can even predict the future events, and He reveals some of those secrets to His prophets. Second, God, rule over, God rules over human affairs. Say that. God rules over, God human, rules affairs. over human affairs. And uh, doesn't mean that God doesn't give us choices. But but I will say this here: you can't do but choose what God wants you to happen. <laughs> That's crazy, ain't it? Yeah. You can't do but what God wants you to do. But you still freely chose. That's crazy, isn't it? Third, evil will ultimately ultimately be overcome. Amen. Although God's army uh, enemies may get the upper uh, enemies may get the upper hand at times in history, the final chapter has not yet been written. I think Donald Trump needs to hear that, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got all these people trying to get him out, and that's something that Amen. you know. Don't worry about it; it'd be all right. Amen. God will come out the victor. 
And finally, the fourth message, God's Messiah Jesus is vital to his plan for the world. Daniel had an... Uh, um, He had a revelation to the mystery of redemption <clears throat> that was given in this here. So, God rules in the kingdom of men. God cares for his own and the superiority of God's kingdom. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. So, I think it's pretty amazing. We need to study it. We need to look at it. And uh, so, when you go through what I have written in my Bible, let's go through that tonight. Go through some of the things. I don't know how much you've got marked up in the book of Daniel. A lot of people like this. <clears throat> so tell me, what? Where, where does the um, Aramaic begin in the book of Daniel? It goes all the way through what? Okay. I guess the very first thing I can I can show you that really sticks out to me. I want you to look at this one here. It's in the very first chapter. Chapter uh, chapter 1, verse 2. Look what it says. At, uh, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he besieged it. And watch this here. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into, into his hands with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury house of his God. So, understanding this here is that the only way that Nebuchadnezzar could destroy or take Israel into captivity was how? What does the Bible say? God gave him over into his hands. You see what I mean? So that just one, that's the first thing that jumps at you that already that God is sovereign uh, over those kind of things as well. <coughs> Let's look at this one here. Uh, I'm going to go over to chapters. Of course, there's the handwriting on the wall, chapter 5. Handwriting's on the wall. Chapter verse 6. And the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that his joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against the other fear entered that man when that happened right then look at this one here chapter 17 they said here's if you can if you can tell me I'm going to reward you see tell me tell me what this means nobody could tell Belshazzar what this meant this writing so he said call Daniel I want to know look at what he says here Verse 17, And Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. I do not want any rewards for doing what I'm getting ready to tell you. I'm not doing this for money, in other words. I've got that under it. He's saying, keep the offering. But I have the message. See what I mean? I ha Keep the offering, keep your money, but I got the message and I'm going to deliver it. You see, that was, that was God testing him. That was God still testing him. And even when we get to the point to where we talk about Daniel and the lion's den, Daniel was a young man, some say 8, 17, 18, 19. But by the time that we get to where he's thrown into the lion's den, and it's here, he's 80 or 90 years old. That's how much time has passed when all these years that have passed into his life. He's an old man. See what I mean? So you think about Daniel even as he's passing through. No, he's not that, he's not that old. Yes, he's, he's, he's aged with it. as time has come through. He's aged as well. So if they, were, if they were in Babylonian captivity for 70 years, see what I'm getting at? And some of them went home. Then you can still see where he, got, he was an old man by the time the end of the book of Daniel takes place. Somebody said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You know what I mean? So he's learned a lot. But no, but here's the thing. But here's the thing. Even in that, that's what I wanted to show you here in this chapter right here, that God was still testing his character. I'm not, you know, I've already been in high places before. You know, I've already been ruler over all this and everything here. And he says, if you will, if you will tell me, I'll reward you as well. And you keep your money. Ain't no big deal. But I got the message. I'm going to tell you what it is. You've been waiting the balance and found wanting. Wow. And uh, I got it here in my Bible. Uh, 
that, uh, look at it, it's here, 580, 538 B.C. I got Daniel. I got him as, at that time. Daniel is 30. Uh, he's 83 years old right here at chapter 6. But I wrote that in my Bible. It kind of helps me tell the story, me to remember the story. He's 83 years old at chapter 6. He's an old man. Ain't that crazy? <clears throat> Then as, we, <clears throat> then as we go on through, I'm up to chapter 7, Daniel's vision of the four beasts. So I've got all this stuff written in, you know, all of this stuff written in there in my Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to flip back one just to show you how much I've got in here. If you go back to chapter 2 in verse 38, thou art the head of gold. <clears throat> then he talks about the kingdom of brass, kingdom of iron. <clears throat> partly strong <clears throat> like in the left side of my Bible I have written 612 BC Babylonian Empire 538 Medo-Persian Empire 330 BC Greek Empire 322 BC and you got 63 BC the Roman Empire comes on this I mean it don't mean anything but when you start studying this that it, it's, that it's, I don't know why they don't I'm sure they do a Bible like that but I don't know but all that information in there means a lot to me when I'm studying the uh, when I'm studying the Bible. Y'all ready? We flip it on through. Then you can get over to chapter nine, verse twenty-four. We're talking about the seventieth weeks are determined upon thy people, the holy city, to finish the transgression and to make end of sins. Uh, you can look at like verse 26 all the way down to verse 27 and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince so when I look at this here I'm looking at Ezekiel I've got written in here Ezekiel 38 and 39 the Antichrist is revealed after the battle of Gog and Magog all this is pieced together here that those two verses has a lot to do with it. Revelation 3, 22, verses 4 to 1. Revelation what? I'm sorry. I'm... Revelation 3, and verse 22, all the way to Revelation 4 and 12. What's that going on? Ain't nobody above us, are they? <laughs> There's demons come out in the name of Jesus. <laughs> So you can also look at um, Antichrist revealed. It talks about it over here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. It says, And in, in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of the flood shall they be overflown from him and shall be broken down, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. He shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the providence. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, the riches, yea. And he shall cast, forecast his devices among the strongholds, even for a time. And verse, look at verse 37 in the same chapter. It talks about Antichrist. Well, let's just do it here at uh, verse 34. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white, even as to the time of the end, because it is yet an appointed time. Verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will. Well, look at verse 37. This is a good one. It's about Antichrist. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. So he, he just say he's a Muslim. He's going to disregard the God of his fathers. Whatever religion he is, even if he's a Christian, he's going to disregard the God of his fathers. See what I'm getting at? He's going to do something. Nor the desire of women. Look at what he says. He'll not have a desire for women. Nor regard... Well, hello, Henry Schaefer here again as your Bible teacher and the host of the program Old and New Testament Survey. I hope you've enjoyed the program. Now, you can reach me at henry at cwchrist.com. 
That's henry at cwchrist.com. If you've got any comments or got any questions, look forward to seeing you again. God bless.